let me, um, before I um, say anything, I'd like to give my thanks here to uh, Wendy and Rainey, not because they have anything to do with the talk that I'm going to give. In fact, I'm going to disagree uh, definitely with Rainey and probably also with Wendy, but um, in the darkest hours at the beginning of the pandemic, the three of us decided we would get through it by spending every Saturday night meeting on Zoom to talk about various great works of literature, um, among them the humanities, of course, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a great joy uh, that has gotten me through and has influenced, I think, some of the things I'm going to say. I am definitely going to cherry pick here. <clears throat> I've often been puzzled by the fact that people name their girl children Cassandra, though it's often shortened to Cassie. For Cassandra, we know, is always the voice of doom, and she's always right, though no one believes her. There are enough public intellectuals in the world who never tire of telling us about the latest turn of the wheel that shows humankind to be finally on the eve of destruction. So I long concluded that in moments when I was feeling despair, and Lord knows there have been some in the last decade or so, I would simply shut up and stay out of the public sphere if I could at least provide a bit of what Kant called orientation and thinking. But the ex exigencies of running an institute pushed me to break my own promise. How could I fairly ask members of the Einstein Forum board to speak about a text we'd all agreed on without contributing something myself. So my contribution will be both more tentative and gloomy than normal, but then the Einstein Forum has been called a laboratory of the mind, spirit, geist, whichever one we call it, it's a place where we can try things out. And I hope someone can tell me I've made a mistake. Because in re reading the Oristaya, the line I keep returning to is Cassandra's, useless. There is no God of healing in this story. Now, it looks as if Athena negates this at the end of the trilogy, as people who know these works better than I do have already pointed out, it's hard to accept the standard account of the play if you read it carefully, even in translation. Aeschylus celebrates the historic achievement of the state of Athens in replacing blood vengeance with trial by jury, sort of. Not a bad way to influence a jury when you're trying to win a prize, though I imagine he believed it at the time. But it's hard to call this resolution a case of justice, apart from being laughably sexist, even assuming utter ignorance about the matter of where babies come from. The arguments never really address the matter at hand. There's the occasional appeal to precedent. Interesting how the gruesome story of Zeus and Kronos could serve as precedent in fifth century Athens. And since law is meant to promote stability, precedent matters. Those of us who've occasionally followed trials of capital crimes know and have been annoyed at how often life and death turn on legal technicalities that have nothing to do with what philosophers and other mortals call justice. And it's hard to forget that a generation later, the Athenian legal system Aeschylus celebrated resulted in the court ordered death of Athens' wisest man. I found myself increasingly moved by the arguments of the Furies, hysterical and screechy as they are. And it's not because, as Rainey put it, there's the, they're the girls team. There's something that feels just about demanding an eye for an eye, even when we know as Martin Luther King often quoted and Gandhi allegedly said that adherence to the principle eventually leaves the whole world blind. Each receives the pain, his pains exact, say the Furies. And it's no surprise they believe that if Orestes goes free, justice on earth will come to an end. Lest we think this isn't a matter of justice, but something more archaic, let's remember, and Kostik has already talked about Abna Kovner. Uh, Kovner, I won't need to do so, um, I only, uh, say we may shudder at the prospect that the plans might have succeeded, but some part of us understands the impulse. 
But there's even more to be said for the Furies or rather for Clytemnestra and that Aeschylus thought so must be reflected in the fact that he gave her the best lines in the whole Oresteia. For what fuels her rage and her crime is not simply her own pain, or as Rainey argued, a question of honor, but at least also outrage at the murder of children. This has nothing to do with arguments, specious or not, about bloodlines. To this day, when we want to claim that something is evil, we focus on crimes against children. Glenn pointed out that one of the Fury's functions is to protect children. Children's suffering is paradigmatic of innocent suffering. Those of us who have raised some will reject kitschy description of children as angels and know nonetheless, whatever meanness or selfishness they may have displayed, nothing they could possibly have done justifies death. With adults, we're not always sure. See Abakovna. Even Karamazov is prepared to reject salvation if it comes at the price of the death of a child. Today, nothing produces moral consensus between parties opposed on everything else, like reports, often spurious, of the sexual abuse of children. Or visceral outrage at the abuse or the murder of children is compounded when it takes place at the hands of those whom children are meant to trust, be it Uncle Atreus, Father Ag Agamemnon, or the local parish priest. Even as the Furies emphasize the horror of matricide, I read Clytemnestra's indignation as underlining the horror of the sacrifice of children. It's a practice we know that happened all over the ancient world. Even the father of monotheism nearly did it. Clytemnestra is rare in seeing it as the unfathomable, unbearable crime that it is. And she is right to rage that no one atoned for the murder of Iphigenia or even protested it, though we're told the priests felt pity. That and a nickel will get you exactly nothing. The winds changed, Troy was sacked. It all looks like a paradigm of evil rewarded, innocent scorned. This is not about bitterness or any other lasting emotion. The chorus of furies says it precisely. I speak in defense of reason. If a Janiah's fate and the triumph of the Achaeans violate the laws of reason. No wonder Clytemnestra cannot stay in her grave. I do not know what could bring her peace. So I admire all the more the Israeli-Palestinian Parent Circle Families Forum, an organization that describes itself as the only association in the world that does not wish to welcome any new members to its fold. The group was founded in the 90s by Israeli and Palestinian parents who had lost a child in the endless wars and chose to do something to stop the cycle of violence. The group is now extended to anyone who, in its words, has lost someone to the conflict who was their entire universe. Through events and dialogues and exhibits that emphasize the importance of understanding each side's narrative of suffering and violence, they are one of many, albeit small, grassroots groups attempting to overcome the endless cycle of recrimination and pain. Like all such groups, their focus is to move away from the question, who started the violence? Instead, the, me the message is simply, this has to have an end. For those who haven't seen it, I urge you to Google this year's joint Israeli-Palestinian Memorial Day ceremony, if only for the extraordinary rendition of Chad Gadya. As anyone who's ever attended a Passover Seder will know, this song ends the evening. But having drunk their obligatory fourth glass of wine, few people are in a state to ask what on earth this peculiar recitation of cycles of violence is doing at the end of a celebration of liberation often sung to make it weirder to a jaunty tune in a major key. I know I never really asked until I saw this performance with additional lyrics by the extraordinary Jewish Arab choir, Rana, check it out. Back for a moment to the humanities. Athena is not the goddess of justice, but the goddess of wisdom. And perhaps because she's wise enough to know there is no way to do justice to all the claims of this case, she settles on a resolution that's meant to bring peace instead, 
Does this make her what Cassandra seeks, a goddess of healing? Orestes is free and the Furies settle down, soothed on the one hand, because Athena acknowledges something of the rightness of their claims. I will bear your angers, she says. And on the other hand, she offers reparations, purple stained robes, power and honor for the rest of all time. Yet a place free of all grief and pain, as Athena calls it, uh, her offer to the Furies is ominous. The only place, so they say, which is free of all grief and pain is the tomb. Athena's offer carries death in its train. The Furies are buried forever. You can call that integration in the community as Carrie did, but it's a very particular form of integration. And if Aeschylus gives us a happy ending, it only took a generation until Euripides, the most modern of the Greek tragedians, gave us another version in which the Furies do not yield to what Athena calls the sweet beguilement of persuasion. Orestes has been tempted to more murder and he's on the run again. The curse on the house of Atreus remains. We hold memory of evil, say the Furies. What to do with such memory? Though Athena gives them powers to affect the world above, <clears throat> she sends them underground with torchlight and purple robes to be sure but deep and subterranean nonetheless. Initially, the Furies protest that they could treat me so. I, the mind of the past, to be driven underground, outcast like dirt. What happens when memories of great crimes have been driven underground? For the past five years, most of my own time has been devoted to following and sometimes contributing to what are various call, variously called the history wars or the memory wars in America. In Germany, more recently, they've been dubbed the Historica Streit 2.0, and they're all over the airwaves. Here's a shout out to Rainy Dastin uh, for calling Twitter the modern day Furies, but um, Rainy seems to be very good with Fury analogy at the moment. Initially, I argued strongly that memories of past crimes should not remain underground while they, where they will fester and ooze till they poison the land above. I still believe that the movement which drove millions of, of Americans to elect a failed fascist from Queens has been driven by a false view of history which repressed the violence of the past, thereby polluting the present. It's the sort of thing we saw when a dead-eyed kid from South Carolina flanked by Confederate flags hoped to start a race war by killing nine people who had welcomed him into their Charleston church. It's actually a case where my heart wants to hang him, though my head is against capital punishment. Something about the Fury's conception of justice makes sense. Since that moment in 2015, I've been convinced that Americans need to stop burying members of past crimes, expose them to the light of reason and seek ways to atone. And I've argued that in doing so, Americans, not to mention the Brits, the Spanish, the Dutch, and Belgians, for starters, can learn from the process that Germans call Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, working through or working off the past. Developments of the last year in both Germany and America have made me uncertain. I won't argue for sending the Stolpersteine or the Berlin Holocaust Memorial underground but I'm increasingly uncertain that the way we're using memories of evil is the way to further healing and worried that it may be the source of new forms of evil. All I have at this point, don't forget this is a laboratory of the mind, are questions and doubts, and I'm hoping some of you will help me answer them in the discussion. For those of you who've been lucky enough to ignore the German discussion of the past year, here's a brief summary. Worried about anti-Semitism rising in this country as it has to a greater degree all over the world, the German government two years ago installed a system of anti-Semitism czars at the federal and state level, significantly none of them Jewish. 
At the same time, Parliament passed a resolution virtually banning as anti-Semitic anyone in the intellectual or cultural world who'd ever come within spitting distance of BDS. Defenders of the resolution insist that such persons are not banned, but only prevented from speaking or showing their work in any state funded venue. But since there's hardly a cultural venue in this country that doesn't receive some state funding, Germany is very generous in funding cultural intellectual pursuits, uh, it does amount to censorship for anyone wanting to do more than speak on a street corner. As a result, the director of Berlin's Jewish Museum was forced to resign. Critical Jewish Israeli artists lost their funding or were disinvited from exhibits and events that had nothing to do with their views on Israel, Palestine. We've been living in the absurd. A large number of Germans, having learned their lessons from the past and full of shame for the Holocaust, have been telling Jews who are full of shame for the occupation that we are anti-Semitic. Being German, say the official guardians of anti-Semitism, now means remembering the Holocaust and remembering the Holocaust means never again. Not never again should similar crimes happen to anyone, but never again should Jews be threatened. Ergo, whatever the government of Israel says is right, is right. Otherwise, we're forgetting the Holocaust. During the most recent war on Gaza, this culminated in a situation where every German political party and all of the mainstream media were obsessed with pictures of some Muslim demonstrators shouting Scheiß Juden in front of a German synagogue, while barely noting the pictures of the devastating bombing that killed 67 children in Gaza. I won't go into further details of the debate, which will continue to fill the media for the foreseeable future. The latest twist was provided by post-colonial theorists who argue that German remembrance of the Holocaust is supported in order to obscure colonial crimes. And this is absurd. Germany deserves recognition as the first nation to invent the concept of Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung thereby breaking a historical paradigm. Normally nations focus on the heroic aspects of their histories. When that fails, they emphasize those parts of their history where they felt like victims. Germany was the first to abandon the hero victim model and acknowledge that it was also a perpetrator, though that acknowledgement came very slowly. Still gradually, a lot of repressed memory was brought to light, often literally, German volunteers dug up the ruins of the Gestapo torture chambers in Berlin. Others spent months uncovering concentration camps or Jewish cemeteries that had been left to ruin, covered over with weeds and vines, as Eva Manasseh describes in her forthcoming novel, Dunkelblum, or Dark and Bloom in English, we hope soon. The physical work of digging up relics of terror that were moldering underground was matched by digging through the archives. It's a lot to expect that the first use of a historically new paradigm should get everything right. Yet in the midst of current debates, I've had to ask what went wrong when the praiseworthy attempt to remember historical crimes turned into a weapon for various political agendas. It cannot be right to forget but how to remember without leashing any number of different furies. Embroiled in the German memory debates, I've also been engaged in American ones. It was only five years ago that most Americans had a hundred year hole in their historical memory, stretching from the end of the Civil War to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. One case in point was the hardly uneducated Hillary Clinton, who managed to confuse Reconstruction and Jim Crow on the 2016 campaign trail. It's safe to say that no reader of the New York Times or the Washington Post or even an avid follower of Netflix would make that confusion today. <clears throat> it may have been a long time coming, but the movement to remember the worst parts of American history has caught on like a house of fire. Some of the work to do so has been unquestionably helpful. It's provoked right-wing backlash, but that shouldn't deter us. Don't forget how much backlash was provoked in West Germany 
by early attempts to insist that the country remember its violent racist past. What concerns me is the tone, the tenor, and not least the historical veracity of many recent American attempts to force the nation to face its past crimes. I won't talk about the 1619 Project, which is now central to American memory debates. Instead, I wanna close with some words about Underground Railroad, released this past May on Amazon, which has received surprisingly little discussion. It's not a stretch to compare TV series to Greek tragedies. First of all, both were binge watched. I tried to imagine binge watching uh, Greek tragedies outside in the heat of Athens. Many contemporary series are extraordinarily well written and they perform similar roles, uniting citizens through shared references and narratives that form fixed frames of cultural reference. Barry Jenkins Underground Railroad, a 10 part filming of Colson Whitehead's novel of the same name is surely one such cultural artifact. And it's not quite true to say it hasn't been discussed. The internet is full of reviews calling it a masterpiece, a monumental work, a quote, absolutely phenomenal show that gets everything right. A brilliant film that's likely to replace Gone with the Wind in American narratives of the Civil War. The latter is probably true, which is why it's important to discuss it. There have been New York Times and New Yorker discussions of how hard the production was on both actors and director, and is the very hardest nine hours of cinema I ever watched, especially since cinematically it's clearly a major achievement. But I've searched for critical discussions of its content and only found two, both in very right wing publications, one of them completely off the rails. Every other review sounds rather like this, and I quote, the nation is profoundly enriched by having the words and images of this series become an enduring part of our shared memory, end quote. What words, what images? <clears throat> the series begins with the most brutal description of a lynching you can probably imagine, an event that leads the main character, a, an enslaved young woman named Cora, to risk escape to freedom via the Underground Railroad. I don't always reject graphic images of violence, and this one is not gratuitous. It's what happens to Cora after she leaves the plantation that gives pause. If usually less bloody, every one of the nine episodes that follows is worse. Each one raises our hopes that Cora, will, that Cora will find peace, if not justice, only to dash them in new ways, as different groups of white people exert new and insidious forms of racism. In the whole nine hours, there's one decent white person. He is old, ineffectual, and spawns the son who is the lead villain of the story. Every other white person is stupid, cowardly, uh, cruel, and usually ugly to boot. And with the exception of one creepy child who's attached to the lead villain, black people are always the source of every virtue. They're strong and self-sufficient, warm and nurturing, wise and healing, and instantly protective of each other. As the first season closes on a slightly hopeful note, provided again by a passing black stranger, we're told there will be a second one. What exactly is national memory profoundly enriched by years of this series? What is any black or white teenager likely to conclude? One thing I'd conclude if I knew no history is that white people can never be trusted. Now Jenkins and Whitehead are dealing in magic realism. The Underground Railroad, which was a metaphor historically, becomes a real train running on tracks deep below the earth. Apparently this bit of invention allows them to avoid every other question of historical accuracy, like the fact that many white abolitionists risked a great deal to work on the Underground Railroad. You needn't take my word for it. Henry Louis Gates, while arguing that free African Americans in the North were predominant in the struggle, writes that, quote, 
The Underground Railroad and the abolition movement itself were perhaps the first instances of, in history of a genuine interracial coalition and the role of the Quakers cannot be gainsaid. Being a conductor on the railroad, Gates continues, was about as popular and dangerous as being a member of the Communist Party in the McCarthy era. Watching Underground Railroad, you'd never guess there were people who fought and sometimes died for the freedom of people who weren't part of their tribe. And it wasn't because they had what's now called a white savior complex. That's something you can do on a campus or anywhere you risk nothing more than a tweet storm. Those people were moved by moral outrage over the violation of everything they ever believed. Had there been more of them, of course, slavery would have ended sooner. Had there been more Germans with guts to defy the Nazis, they could have prevented the war. So they weren't enough, but there were some, both in Mississippi and in Germany, and they matter for reasons Hannah Arendt set out in Eichmann in Jerusalem, when she told the story of one Anton Schmidt, a corporal in the Wehrmacht who was executed for helping Jewish partisans. And I quote Arendt, the lesson of such stories is simple and within everybody's grasp. For politically speaking, it is that under conditions of terror, most people will comply, but some people will not. Humanly speaking, no more is required and no more can reasonably be asked for this planet to remain a place fit for human habitation. Watching underground railroads, relentless spectacle of white savagery and black pain, I reminded myself of Claude Lanzmann's film Shoah. Perhaps people, Jewish and otherwise, needed those hardly bearable nine hours of detail about the Holocaust in order to grasp its horror. The fact that this crime has been abused by right-wing agendas make it, makes it no less a crime. So perhaps we need Underground Railroad too. And yet as Thomas Chatterton Williams said in a recent interview, once we know that racism and sexism are wrong, at what point do we keep pulling off the scab? Though most people I know disagree, I've always preferred Schindler's List to Shoah. At the very least, both kinds of stories are needed. There were decent Germans, just not enough of them, as there were decent white people who worked for abolition. And if you want to avoid Dylan Roof's race war, there's only one way to go, to recognize that people aren't determined by their ethnic origin to go one way or another. Sometimes we do things for reasons. While worrying about the idea that there may be no way to get both peace and justice, if historical justice means digging up all the historical injustice that's laying underground, I had to recall that what's popularly known as the US lynching memorial is officially called the National Memorial for Peace and Justice created by the extraordinary black lawyer and activist, Brian Stevenson, it is worth a trip to Alabama. No one in America has done more to connect the crimes of the present with our ignorance of the crimes of the past. No one has worked harder for justice past and present. His awesome, true sense of the word awesome, his awesome memorial to the victims of American lynching was inspired by German memorials whose influences are built into the space. When I interviewed Stevenson a few years ago in Montgomery, one of his claims particularly struck me. And I quote Brian Stevenson, you should be proud of those white Southerners in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama who argued in the 1850s that slavery was wrong. There were white Southerners in the 20s who tried to stop lynchings and you don't know their names. The fact that we don't know their names says everything we need to know." End quote. If we remembered them, said Stevenson, quote, we can actually claim a heritage rooted in courage and defiance of doing what is easy and preferring what is right. 
we can make that the norm we want to celebrate as our Southern history and heritage and culture. And because even when I'm feeling uncertain, I feel bound to end on at least a somewhat hopeful note, um, I wanna show you a quotation from Stevenson that's etched on the memorial with the thought that possibly the resolution of peace and justice can only be affected by art. This is the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And I hope you can read the words. Can people see the words? Yes. So I um, want to end with a counter argument to my own argument by Brian Stevenson and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, can you stop? Yes. All right. Okay, the floor is open and we already have a comment or two comments, um, in fact, in the Q&A. Uh, once again, from Mario Kessler. Uh, who writes, you mentioned the grassroots group of Israeli and Palestinian parents who lost their child during the Ar Israeli-Arab conflict. That reminds me, obviously, of the writer David Grossman, who lost a son on the very last day of the Lebanon War in 2006, later documented in his book, Falling Out of Time. Did Grossman join this group or was he in touch with it? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess, I guess David is... Yeah, I guess David is best uh, positioned to, to answer it. Uh, um, yeah, I, um, of course, I know the group, I know some of the founding figures. Uh, David Grossman was never actually a member of this group, as far as I know. Uh, but of course, he shares the whole world with them, including the personal loss of his son. Um, so I, I saw Carrie's hand up first. Oh, well, I have a very quick question, um, which maybe other people know the answer to it or would like to know it. Who wrote those words, Susan, that you showed us? So, um, Brian Stevenson, um, you know, we're looking for sainthood, which he would, of course, utterly reject, comes cl goes close in that direction. Um, it's the only quote in the entire memorial, which is very large and has a number of quotes from Toni Morrison and other people. It's the only quote that is not attributed. So oh. I am assuming it was written by Brian. Yes, I was wondering. Thank you. David. Yeah, um, so uh, Glenn will correct me if I'm wrong about this, but this is about binge watching of tragedies in Athens. Um, <laughs> if I remember correctly, every um, adult male citizen of Athens in the fifth century BC was required by law to watch, <laughs> um, actually to binge watch uh, tragedies. They always came in groups of four, three tragedies followed by a satyr play. And um, they went on for several weeks, actually. So I, apparently it's possible. <laughs> and then I, um, I wanted to, I can't resist making a kind of personal comment about the Underground Railway, because I grew up in a small town in Iowa, northern Iowa, and that was very much on the uh, routes of the, one of the prevalent routes of the uh, Underground Railway. And there were all kinds of stories about people who had hidden slaves in their basements and things like that. And all that was some part of the local pride. But, uh, you know, growing up there in the 1950s and 1960s, I can tell you there was a river through the town, through the middle of the town. And on the west side of the river lived white people. And on the right side of the river lived some poor whites, but mostly black people. There was no black person allowed to even buy a house. This is in Iowa with the Underground Railway on the west side of the town until uh, sometime in the early 1970s when that distinction finally broke down. So I think, you know, one wants to avoid the romanticization, even of good people. You know, put it this way, um, no question, but that, you know, even uh, 
uh, fighting for abolition with a possible exception of John Brown, who really was not a racist and, uh, you know, and commented on by many people went way further than everybody else did. Um, but that fighting for abolition, abolition or being involved in the civil rights movement did not, uh, you know, mean that racism was uh, not an issue, completely granted. I am just arguing mm -hmm. against a really disturbing tendency that I'm seeing in the popular culture. First of all, um, you know, good people aren't, are not only not romanticized, they're barely there. You know, they're just, this is, you know, we talk about victims instead of talking about heroes. And I, my next book is going to be about that. Um, I haven't worked it out entirely, but I, I think it's, um, I think it's a really dangerous turn in the popular culture, although I think it began from a very good impulse, namely, you know, usually history was written by the victors and the victims had no voice at all. Um, but I think the direction in which we're going is very problematic. I'm just wondering, because I've asked a bunch of people whether they've seen Underground Railroad, and so far I'm the only person of my acquaintance. Has anybody else seen it? You have. Oh, very good, Caustic. Okay, um, good. And I can at least talk <laughs> talk about it with you because, um, since as a, as a film, it's a brilliant achievement. There's no question about it. But I I really worry about the the message that's getting across. Actually, Caustic is next on my list anyway. Well, I I share. Um, I'm actually, no, I, I don't share your concern. I'm very angry. <laughs> I think that this film, which is cinematographically brilliant, yeah. but so were Lenny Riefenstahl's documentaries, okay? That this film risks installing a completely false history and Actually, I'm glad it's so horribly difficult to watch because that might prevent it. <laughs> but what I'm worried about is um, you spoke about memory and a source reference, it's either Underground Railroad or The Pianist or Schindler's List. This is not memory. Um, the Oresteia is not a historical source for the study of ancient Athens. It's a source for the study of contemporary humanity because that's what great art does. But we cannot confuse the two. And the reason you're doing this is that everybody is doing it, okay? We do have a substitution of historical text which usually is ambiguous, open to different interpretation, demands prior knowledge, and is difficult to read, and a cinematographic or even a written version of that already provides the conclusions. I think that's scary. And I also want to very strongly agree with you about the need, the obligation and the need to remind us of heroes. Um, because essentially only the memory of heroes can jolt us out, out of our complacency that nothing can be done anyway. Uh, I have the great privilege of knowing many Polish righteous Gentiles. And the one thing they all had in common, they're a completely disparate band, okay? From militant communists to bigoted reactionary Catholic fundamentalists, from thieves to princes of the blood, if, if that's any difference, okay? Um, and the only thing that those people had in common is was an incapacity to allow themselves to be convinced that it's none of their business. Uh, I remember an old guy who told me, Mr. Look, I'll be frank with you. I don't like Jews, okay? 
I didn't like them then. And please forgive me, you're a nice person. I don't like Jews today. I just couldn't help myself. Okay, we need to remind people that th such a reaction exists, it's legitimate, and it saves the planet, okay? But also, I think that there is a very fundamental role to be played by shame. Because once we know of the heroes, we don't have excuses anymore, right? We should be ashamed of not doing what others were capable of doing under incomparably more horrible circumstances. And I was reminded of this during an extremely ugly debate in the Polish parliament. That was the late 90s when the State Historical Institute, the Institute for National Remembrance, an Orwellian name if there ever was one, had actually done something very good. They published a huge historical report on the massacre in Niedwabne, very clearly placing the blame where it belongs and documenting it. The chairman of the Institute, mercifully of Catholic peasant stock, uh, was accused by MPs of betraying Poland. And I still remember him standing up, confronting one of those MPs and saying, sir, I will not be deprived of my right to feel ashamed. Mm. Mm. But for that, we need the heroes, we need the testimony, and we can't go for second best. Um, second best, which is, um, be it a series, be it a good series, okay? That's not the problem. It avoids us doing the intellectual and the moral work that needs to be done for people to take action. And I think that the capacity of feeling ashamed is so crucial uh, that um, I'm actually not sure if I agree with you on the BDS gas, I think. We'd have to sit down and discuss that. But I absolutely, I prefer you to err on the side of shame than on the side of satisfaction, right? Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've talked my head off much too long. Uh, I just want to say I'll have to leave in a moment because it's almost Shabbat. So it was wonderful seeing you virtually and hearing you virtually. And I hope to be actually able to see you and talk with you in the flesh. Next year in Kaput. But Kostik, <laughs> Kostik thank you. Um, uh, question of clarification. I don't support BDS and I don't believe... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the group yes. support BDS, although we've been accused of it time and time again. No, okay. no, it, no, no it's, it's the issue of the guild by association thing. I, I, I'm even not sure if I'm entirely with you on that, but I prefer you to err on that end than the opposite. Knowing you as I do for a number of years now, I think we would agree with each other, but maybe we can Zoom sometime since we probably won't see each other for a while. Mm -hmm. I want to hear about your genocide, your comparative genocide book. Okay. Um, maybe just one answer to your remarks. I, where I would slightly disagree with you. First of all, by the way, Brian Stevenson also, it's so funny, um, both talked about the need for heroes and in particular white heroes but also about the need for shame. So um, that's, um, you know, I, I think he has a very nuanced way of seeing that. Um, I'm not sure about historical memory. That is, of course, um, if you want to know exactly what the justice system of uh, ancient Athens was like, you need to find a historian who can tell you all the ways in which it differs from what we have represented in the uh, Oresteia, obviously. And yet memory is, as we know, very different from history and into memory come all kinds of cultural artifacts that you know, particularly after long periods of time or even short ones will become part of historical memory, even if they're not 
historical. And that's what worries me about Underground Railroad. And I'm glad you were angry at it because um, it's, it's, it is going to be, you're right. The only, the only way that it may not replace Gone with the Wind is because it's so hard to look at that people may not do so. So thank you. Shabbat thank shalom. You. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. So uh, next on my list is Amia, followed by Remy, and then uh, we'll have to close this part of the discussion uh, and uh, move on to David's talk. Amia, please. Thanks so much, Susan, for that very powerful talk. I don't really have a question so much as just um, a, a thought about the dialectic and that, that concerns you. So um, I, I'm afraid I haven't seen the Underground Railroad, but I take it that what you're worried about is this tendency that you're noticing in popular culture that to, towards a kind of deterministic insistence on a kind of hard binary between good victims on one hand and evil perpetrators on the other. And of course, this is um, historically problematic, but I take it for you that it's it's ethically worrying because it closes down that all important space between the possibilities of each individual moral imagination and what the rating ideological script says we are, right? Um, so th this is, I think you're right to say, a trend in contemporary popular culture, but it's also a you know, um, an issue of intense contestation in feminist theory for decades now, right? So I'm thinking in particular of um, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin's account of male power as a kind of totalizing system of, of perfect, metaphysically perfect domination that acts through each and every man. And, you know, someone like Jacqueline Rose or Judith Butler, any kind of more psychoanalytically oriented uh, feminist theorist wants to reject this picture of male power precisely on the grounds that it closes down, again, that all important ethical space between, you know, on one hand, the infinite possibilities of the individual psyche and the external political structures. Um, and so while I think that critique of McKinnon and Dworkin is right, I think it doesn't really tend to recognize what someone like McKinnon or Dworkin might be up to. Right, and similarly, maybe even what the Underground Railroad might be up to, right? So they, they, they're often dismissed as just kind of infantilizing women, just um, reinforcing their victim status. But I actually think what someone like McKinnon is trying to do is, but precisely by kind of performatively shutting down the possibilities of male consciousness, she's trying to performatively construct the possibilities of female agency. Right, precisely in um, demarcating women as victims, she's actually trying to make them empowered subjects. And this is very similar to, I think, how you know we should read the later Fanon, right? So in something like Black Skin, White Masks, you have Fanon, you know, having making these kind of humanistic gestures, uh, crossing the the line, the uh, the line of. Um, you know the colonial colonized uh, line, but then you know by we get by the time we get to Wretched of the Earth, it's just a few years later, we have Fanon basically insisting that it's only through the shutting down of the consciousness of the colonial um, subjugator that you get the creation of uh, the full agency of the colonized subject. Now I'm not endorsing that view, but I do think it's it's a it's a view that needs to be taken on when you when you want to offer a kind of critique. Um, one that I'm very sympathetic to of these kinds of um, perform performative utterances. So it's been a long time since I've read McKinnon and Dworkin, and I, I won't comment on that exactly, but you see um, a similar thing going on in Underground Railroad. And in fact, one of the things that's been praised about the, the series is that it's, um, you know, it's a, uh, him to black self-sufficiency and the way that um you know even in these really terrible situations um black people not only survive but were nurturing and creative and um that's fine uh and i can see that as having a function um as as conceivably it it has for women um, the other binary, well, it's not so much a binary. I'm not just worried about the binary between the pure victim and the evil, uh, 
perpetrator and all of that. I'm really worried about the biological determinism, which has come to suggest that your ethnic origin is, you know, basically the only real uh, determinant of what it, whatever you do. And um, it's, I, I, I think it's something that's been strengthened a lot by things like evolutionary psychology. I don't want to go too much into detail with that, but we're living in a world in which it's um, very hard to say that people do things for reasons and very easy to say that they're biologically determined either by their ethnic uh, you know, background or um, you know, other factors to take one side or the other because, and this is even worse for me than the ethnic determinism, because in the end, it's all about power. Um, and justice doesn't play a role. It's all about power. And it is natural that each group perpetuate its own power, basically perhaps with occasional thin restraints, but um, not very much. And so you have this really rather funny situation. Well, sorry, I shouldn't go off into the whole theoretical, my you know philosophical problems with, and I hope we can talk about it sometime. I'd really um, value that. Um, so, yeah, I think you see exactly the same problem in, in underground railroad, which is that yes, the victims become not just virtuous and strong and subjects, but they are the source of every virtue and they are the only source of virtue in nine hours of film. And that's a problem, it seems to me. I don't Maybe. know if I Again, to answer your question, Amia. No, but... no, you absolutely did. And I would love to talk to you more about this. I think it's a fantastic project. Thanks. Susan, I, I completely agree with you that art will supplant history. I say that with regret as a historian, but I believe it to be true. And my question is, what should the art be about that we want to have? And for me, the most moving line in that extremely moving inscription on the memorial that you showed us was, abandoned by the rule of law. It seems to me that however inspiring, however admirable, however shaming um, the actions of heroes are, they are as not if they are not crystallized in institutions that can somehow create structures that will create justice. And one of the, one of the reasons for rereading the humanities is whatever we may think of the justice meted out by that trial, it is great art about an institution, about the creation of an institution. And my question for you is, what kind of art about what kind of institutions could be made now to serve that cause of justice? I mean, I actually think the, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice is a piece of art. It's an extraordinary piece of art. I have never seen, um, any memorial like it. It's very large. It has all kinds of features. So I, you know, that is a piece of art. Thinking about something that would have the reach and um, memory shaping power of cinema. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. I have occasionally um, some ideas about directions I could go. And we had a conversation last night about writing um, theater or screenplays that I've never tried. I <laughs> have written a novel, but I've never tried to write, uh, to write for the screen. But I think that anything that did so would have to follow these two principles that, um, that both Kostek uh, and unknowingly, unknowing that Brian Stevenson emphasizes both as well. Um, it has to show shame. It cannot uh, bury it. It cannot entirely bury crimes, though I really did like Thomas's remark of, you know, how often do you pull off the scab? Um, it's, I think it's a really good question. But some of the time, um, 
you know, I mean, there's no drama if there's not pain, suffering, and usually crime, as I think Carrie and Daniel were saying last night. Um, so, you know, there needs to be a source of shame. I, you know, I, your question about institutions, I'm really going to think about, have to think about a lot more because, of course, when when we think about a lot of classic heroes, um, you know, justice activists, they're usually working against the institutions that they're living in. I mean, you, John Brown, you know my, you know, thoughts about, but you know, even um, people in this century. Most of them are working outside and often strongly against the institutions. I don't actually know of a piece of art that gives us a hero who's successfully battled an unjust institution and then somehow becomes incorporated it, incorporated into it and um, you know, helps to further the, you know, uh, the just institution along. If somebody has any good ideas, please let me know. Um, I don't, uh, I don't know if that's the kind of thing that can be done actually in, in art. It's, um, it's quite tricky. Um, but thanks for the question. I'll think more about it. David, did you have a question before? Oh, okay. Okay, it's now 8.14. Um, so instead of taking a one minute break, um, I suggest that maybe we continue directly with David. Susan, did you want to take over as chair? I can do that, yes, um, just because on the, first of all, on the principle that, um, that people shouldn't share more than two sessions at once, um, but secondly, on uh, the principle that it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce my friend, David Schulman, um, among his um, many other qualities, he's been the longtime chair of the board, advisory board of the Einstein Forum, I've seen David introduce himself as a professor of Sanskrit. This is um, a serious understatement for anybody who knows his work. But I will just say that I'm particularly um, proud that David is with the Einstein Forum because for the last 20 years, while he is still writing and working on Indian languages and literatures, his heart has been in the struggle for peace and justice in the occupied territories. And I, that, I, I assume, dear David, that's what you're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, 